Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance in the Crawl Space Studios in Wormtown. Lance, how are you? I'm doing very well. How are you today? I am doing well, though it is a bit hot in these studios today. We do run a hot microphone over here, but I never knew that it would translate into the entire studio. It's mostly because of the weather. It's summer in New England here in Wormtown, of course. The worm is losing weight. He's he's got the uh, the humidity diet going right now. He's got his beach body going. Yep, yep. Doing the uh, the summer cut. So Lance, for this episode today, we speak with Jennifer Amell, the filmmaker from Pennsylvania who has been covering the suitcase Jane Doe mystery. And uh, this is now, again, the fourth episode we're doing on this series. So if you want to check out the first three, that's probably a good idea before you check out this one. Yeah, Jen has returned to the show. She has some new information. We, we clear up some, some information, but she, uh, she gives some stuff at the end of the interview that we think is really important. So make sure you listen for that at the end. And uh, if you want more information on Suitcase Jane Doe, she has her website, Suitcase Jane Doe. Dot com where you can check out her her entries, uh, some videos. She does a lot of work on the ground out there in Pennsylvania looking into this case. Okay, and if you want to check out the first three episodes of this series, they should be available on our feed, but if for whatever reason they are not, that means they are now on Stitcher Premium. You can check that out at stitcherpremium.com. Use code MMM and get a free month. It's $4.99 per month after that, but it is worth it. You get our entire Crawl Space archive. You get the creator commentary series we are doing for Missing Maura Murray. You get Empty Frame and just a ton of other shows, comedies. True Crime Garage does a Stitcher Premium only show. It's a great deal for true crime users and comedy lovers. Yeah, and the uh, creator commentary for Missing More Murray is really fun for us to do, and it's also informative for us to do, and it's very informative for the listener. Hearing us go back and update information, maybe correct some information, I think, and you think, uh, is very important for the case of uh, More Murray. I want to say one quick thing about the Suitcase Jane Doe case and Jen's work on that. This is something that has happened thousands and thousands and thousands of times. We touch on it a little bit in the interview where we talk about why law enforcement has certain facilities where they house Doe's, whether Jane Doe's or John Doe's, and and these victims have no names yet, and then eventually they have to destroy uh, most of their evidence that includes some of the body or all of the body. So this is just one case, and this is why we're working on this with Jen, this is just one case amongst thousands and thousands and thousands. So if you take one thing from the suitcase Jane Doe case and the work that Jen's put into it, take this, that it's one case, it's one person, but that's one person closer to an answer. And if you have a case that you have in mind and and you want to make some phone calls and the case is 30 years plus old or 20, 30 years, look at how Jen has handled this, the people she's talked to, and how she works with law enforcement and how she works with witnesses, including the man who actually found uh, Suitcase Jane Doe, the upper half of her body in the suitcase in Pennsylvania. Good point, Lance, and well done by Jen Amell. So thank you, Jen, for bringing that to us and bringing awareness to this case because I know a lot of people had never heard of it before, including us. And, Lance, we do have a Patreon page that is rocking and rolling over there. Check that out at patreon.com slash crawlspacepodcast. We do weekly vaults, and uh, it's a lot of fun. And the weekly vault is sort of a true crime update. It's sort of a what's going on now with true crime, and we have some topics. and Yeah, news and behind the scenes, too, from our the podcast. Scenes, yeah. And you'll enjoy our intern, Brian the King, Brian the Trivia King. Yeah, we played Stump the King with our intern, and uh, he might be gone for the summer, but uh, he will be back, I think, at some point. And I think we'll probably give him a call while he's out there uh, lifeguarding on some beach oh, in uh, Cape us. Cod. Pardon us, Burger he's King. Out, he's out there lifeguarding, and he doesn't have time to come in the uh, dewy confines of the Crawl Space Studios, as commodious as they are. All right, so check that out at patreon.com slash crawlspacepodcast, and thank you for listening, and check out Jen Amell's work at suitcasejanedoe.com. Thank you. Welcome back to Crawl Space. Jen Amell, how are you today, Jen? I'm doing awesome. You guys? Doing very well. We're excited to have you back to talk more uh, Suitcase Jane Doe. Yes, very excited. We got a doozy today. 
We are, and we and we do, and uh, we met you at uh, the American Investigative Society of Cold Cases back in April, and uh, that was a lot of fun hanging out with you. Yeah, yeah, it was great to meet you guys in, in the flesh. Did you make any uh, good contacts over there? I met uh, prosecutor Michelle Kazuba, very interested in her work and super dedicated. Well, a lot's been going on with the Suitcase Jane Doe case and your coverage. I just want to say real quick that you were able to go to the ASOC conference because of your former employer, Echelon Services. They sponsored your trip there, which was really cool of them. I don't want to let that go unnoticed uh, on this episode. Yes, they're a great company, great uh, private investigation company and uh, private security company as well here in Pennsylvania. Take us through what's been going on since uh, since you started covering Suitcase Jane Doe. So Suitcase Jane Doe, as we know, is a a cold case from 1995. It was a half of a woman uh, was discovered in the Twin Tunnels in Downingtown, Pennsylvania. She was in a suitcase. And then subsequently, six months later, her legs or what is believed to be her legs were discovered about an hour away in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. She is not identified and her killer has never been caught. And that's about an hour away. So what was it, like 50 miles or so? Yeah, just about. And it was uh, six months after, and it was Mm -hmm. on a, I guess, is that a popular walking trail, a walking path? Yeah, it's it's quite a large park. It's called Core Creek Park. They have like a baseball field, um, playground, and then many hiking and jogging trails. Her legs were found on a jogging trail by a runner who stumbled across it and subsequently called the police. Don't want to let these details go unnoticed because it is a bit of a review for people who have listened to the previous episodes, but it is very important to say where they were found, the duration in between the two discoveries when Buck Plank discovered the torso of Suitcase Jane Doe, her legs had been removed because we don't believe that they were cut off. We believe that they were actually popped out of the socket. Those were found about 50 miles away, six months later, by a jogger, someone who had, like you said, stumbled on them. And it didn't seem like they had been very well hidden in the first place. It looked like as if animals might have started to pull them up, correct? There was believed to be a shallow grave dug in the dirt there, and the legs were in a pair of green plastic trash bags along with a few articles of clothing that was determined to be the same size as the torso located six months previous. But yes, some animals had gotten to it, sort of ripped the bags apart and and dragged the legs So in our last episode, we actually said that there's a chance that these legs might not have belonged to this particular Jane Doe whose torso was found. It's that they had similar markings on them and they fit the the joint that they would have been twisted out of. The lead investigator on the case, Trooper Chad Roberts, is operating under the assumption that they are her legs, but it isn't like a hard fact that they belong to her. Chances are they're probably hers because of those cut marks, but we'll get into the details, which makes this a little bit more confusing as we go along. We like confusing here at Crawl Space. Oh, we love it. Confusing uh, Crawl Space. (laughs) And uh, so you talked to the man who found the suitcase, Buck Plank, and we played a little bit from that interview, I think, on the third episode with you. You can find that video on my blog, www.suitcasejanedoe.com. Great. So check that out because he's a really interesting character and you were sort of at a breaking point where you you had to figure out where to go from there. And so where have you gone since we last spoke? You know, I've reached out to the DA of Bucks County, Judge Alan Rubenstein. Uh, I didn't get a call back from him, but I'm hopeful in the future that he'll reach out. Bucks County, where the legs were found. Yeah, actually, let's just give an overview of the investigation here because we it's super confusing and very complex because we've got two counties involved. We've got Chester County where the torso was found in the suitcase. And then we have Bucks County, an hour away, where the legs were found. So we have the state police involved, two counties, and then a lot of third-party forensics professionals who reviewed uh, autopsies. In Chester County, the DA at the time was Judge Anthony Sarcione, and I did get the opportunity to speak with him on WCHE 1520 here in Westchester, Pennsylvania. And he he was a good guy. I mean, you guys listened to the interview. He, he seemed very interested in the case at the time. Um, he was there on scene. He saw the suitcase, um, he, and it seemed to be like a, a very emotional subject for him. 
that it was never solved and they, they never made progress in the case. So alongside the DA, we've got our Chester County coroner. His name is Peter Giannopoulos, but he never actually autopsied the torso. He, the Chester County coroner was never involved in the autopsy. Then we've got a couple county detectives as well. And then we have a long list of uh, PA state police uh, captains, troopers, lieutenants, it kind of reads like the Old Testament, like Abraham begot so-and-so, who begot <laughs> so-and-so. Um, but so from 1995 to 96, we have Lieutenant David Conan. Then we have a trooper, Patrick Quigley, who was an investigator for the state police. And then from 96 to 97, we have Captain Henry, uh, I'm going to butcher his last name, Olensiak, I think. That's really good. <laughs> um, and then... There's a bit of a gap in the uh, latter half of the 1990s and early 2000s, but then we moved to Trooper Chad Roberts, who is the current lead on the case, and he's had this for about four years. Is the same uh, sort of chain of custody uh, similar in Bucks County with the legs? I didn't run across any kind of chain of custody with Bucks County, I think they may have turned it over to the state police immediately okay. because it was, I mean, the, the autopsy for the legs was immediately connected to the torso because, you know, you have a torso with no legs, you have legs with no torso. Um, that seemed to be in the system. They were all talking to each other and this joint autopsy was organized pretty soon after the location of the legs. And then, so in Bucks County, I mentioned before, we have our district attorney, Honorable Alan M. Rubenstein who uh, the DA in Chester County, Sarcion, has nothing but good things to say about. He was very involved and very helpful. And that guy's still around? or He is. He is retired. Same with Sarcion. So it's it's a little difficult to locate these people because they, they no longer have an office to contact. You said that we'd get to the Chester County coroner. So this guy, Peter Giannopoulos, I don't know much about him, but in... My readings through newspaper clippings uh, just before the discovery of the torso and then just after, he was in the newspaper a lot. This guy, Giannopoulos, he was never indicted for any wrongdoing, um, but he apparently didn't handle the disposal of a victim very well. Um, this was a 1995 case of uh, a child murder, unfortunately, and when he did the autopsy, he authorized the disposal of remains. Um, before they were able to determine that it was, in fact, a homicide. So there was a lot of weird stuff going on with him. Are we talking about incompetence? Potentially, or just, you know, run-of-the-mill mistake. Okay. He ordered the disposal of a body that had been autopsied? The disposal of some organs. Okay. A child death that was suspicious, that was later determined to be a homicide. So it wasn't a homicide at the time. Correct. So he authorized the disposal of some organs that could have been used. Is there a suspect in that murder then? Is that a solved case? It is a solved case okay. now. They were okay. able to solve it. It was the parent of this child who Jesus murdered. Jesus Christ. Yeah, it was awful. Well, that's, um, yeah. But because of Giannopoulos' actions, it made it that much harder to prove um, a cause of death. And so, I mean, he was all over the news about that, but he never formally indicted or charged with anything. Right. It's not like he knew the the suspect or something like that, right? I mean, it's not like he was working in cahoots with them as far as we know. Yeah, I think it was just neglect. When we find the torso, this is July 1995, it's handed over to the state police. And this was kind of a no man's land, the Twin Tunnels, where the body was found. So it didn't belong to any particular mun municipality, it didn't belong to any local police. So it was given to the state police. I'm not sure if the state police are under any obligation to go to the county nearest, if they're obligated to go to that coroner. They may have not gone to Giannopolis because this was a story that broke right before the torso was found. So maybe his um, reputation was in question the state police decided not to go to Giannopoulos with this autopsy. Instead, they went to another questionable medical examiner. This guy is named Dr. Richard Callery, and he was the medical examiner for the state of Delaware. I'm not sure why they went to him. So you're theorizing that due to Giannopoulos's 
improper disposal of of this body you're you're theorizing that that is why richard callery was contacted he's not a coroner he's a medical examiner they didn't want someone who could possibly be inept in determining the identity of this particular torso yeah okay. exactly but this is all speculation on my part i'm just trying to figure out what was going on at, at the time what would be running through the investigators minds and i'm not totally sure why they went with richard Callery. it seems a little strange that they would go out of state the state police would go out of state did he have a good reputation he did yeah unfortunately <laughs> um much later in 2015 Callery was convicted indicted and convicted of using state workers and equipment to run his private consulting business i'm wondering if the torso autopsy was part of this illegal private consulting on Callery's part and i'm not saying that, that this illegal business has anything to do with like his integrity as a medical examiner but it does kind of throw shade on his character so his illegal private consulting dated back to the mid-90s? Yeah, this had been going on for quite a while. He was using state workers and state equipment, Delaware state workers and Delaware mm -hmm. state equipment, to run mm -hmm. his private consulting business. What was he, con it was it a medical consulting business? Yeah. You're thinking that there was some sort of connection between him being a private consultant for the Suitcase Jane Doe case? Potentially. Okay. Again, just speculation. I'm not sure because he was running a private consultant meant that he was a bad medical examiner. He could have been very competent. But if you don't have the Chester County community or the Pennsylvania community holding a person responsible, not aware of certain protocol happening with this medical examiner. I mean, how can you be sure of the legitimacy of the talk screen of like the no cause of death? Uh, I mean, it, it calls all of that into question. And I'm assuming you have looked into contacting Calorie. Is that something that is a possibility? It's a possibility. I just don't have any information on him now. Sarcion, the uh, DA for Chester County that I spoke to, he brought Calorie up in our radio show and had good things to say about him. It's like he kind of has to say his name and say something good about him because he's connected to Suitcase Jane Doe. Yeah, he has to sort of support his decision to go to this man because that I'm assuming that was the DA's decision. Is Calorie still in prison? No. Okay. Did he get a sentence? He had to pay some restitution, like thousands of dollars. Okay. What about DNA? Have you spoken with anyone from the state police who says anything about DNA? So I contacted uh, the company called Parabon, which does uh, phenotyping and isotope analysis for cold cases uh, or missing persons cases, that sort of thing. And I sort of submitted the suitcase Jane Doe case for them to look into. Would it be viable? And they said to get the attention of the state trooper, the lead investigator, and have them liaise with Parabon. Separately, I talked to trooper Chad Roberts, and he mentioned that he had been in contact with Parabon about suitcase Jane Doe, and that they were in the process of determining if the DNA they had on file was viable to, to phenotype and do some ancestry analysis and stuff. It was kind of a confused conversation on that point because neither Roberts nor I know anything about forensic science. So he's like, I don't we'll know. Join it's the like club. 20 points they need to make yeah. as a match. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, welcome to the club. <laughs> the thing about that is it's all changing so rapidly. It's not mainstream to the point where it, it clicks in people's heads unless you have some experience with it. And we really don't have much. We do know there's a lot that's possible. And so one thing they never did, apparently, is use DNA from the legs and the torso to match them, obviously. So that's out the window because the body was destroyed, right? Yeah, let's backtrack a little bit. We'll get to that point. So when the legs were discovered, about a month afterward, they called this joint autopsy. And this was conducted at the Phoenixville Hospital Morgue, which is a town in between... Uh, Downingtown and uh, Langhorn, Pennsylvania in Bucks County. So it's kind of like a rendezvous point for, for all the officials involved in this investigation. So uh, it was witnessed by detectives from both Chester and Bucks County, and it was performed by three forensic anthropologists. Uh, the lead uh, anthropologist was this guy called Hal Fillinger, and he had he has a spotless record. This guy is decorated. Unfortunately, he is 
deceased at this time. And then there was two other guys, uh, Dr. Thomas Christ and Dr. Arthur Washburn. So I reached out to both of these guys. Dr. Christ um, played a little bit of phone tag with me, and I did surprise him at his university office. Nice. He's like, oh, yeah, I know what you're doing. Good job and stuff, but I just don't have any time to talk to you. I'm sorry, you surprised him at his office? Like, you went there or you called his office? I called his office. Oh, man, that would be awesome if you went there. It's in Utica, but I did manage to speak to Arthur Washburn, and he was not lead on this autopsy at all. I mean, he was under uh, Christ, and Christ allegedly still has the report from this autopsy. Okay. I mean, he was the first one to admit that his memory was a little hazy, but he tried to recall as many details as possible. How did you approach that conversation? Was Washburn pretty much cool with a random person calling and saying, I'm, I'm just a civilian and I'm looking into this case? Surprisingly cool. Okay. I'd be suspicious if somebody called me out of the blue and wasn't attached to any agency and was asking questions about it. But I imagine they've had calls from journalists in the past who've tried to revisit this case. So he did say that he did not have the report in front of him. Any hope in being able to track that down? Yeah, if I can if I can get Dr. Chris to speak to me. Okay. I'm sure he listens to Crawl Space. So So Dr. Chris, (laughs) we know you're listening. Or uh, if anyone knows Dr. Chris, please uh, get him on the horn. Get him on the horn. Get that uh, get that report into uh, Jenna Mel's hands. Yeah, right? It's not that he's being cagey or anything. I'm sure he's just a busy man. So getting back to uh, Dr. Washburn. He said that the lower extremities were decomposed pretty horribly. If the legs were dropped at the same time and they weren't preserved at all since the time of death of the torso, they would have been sitting out in the wilderness for six months. And he said that they were able to scrape a little soft tissue off of the bones, but not too much. It was mostly decomposed. They were able to match 15 points of cut marks on a hip bone, which is called the acetabulum. Well done. So they were able to match uh, 15 cut marks on the like ball joint of the leg and the hip socket, the acetabulum. Washburn said that this was determined to be a blade that was small and sharp. It wasn't a saw. It wasn't like a, a long machete or anything. It wasn't a hack. It was kind of small cuts around the tissue, the skin, the muscle, to separate that from the bone. And then the leg, as we mentioned before, was pulled out of the hip socket. Okay, I want to be clear that Arthur, Dr. Arthur Washburn told you this information. Mm-hmm. and he physically saw the leg and the torso and matched up those cuts? Here's the weird part. Okay. Dr. Washburn maintained that he never saw the torso. Never saw the torso? hmm Okay. He saw pictures of the torso, I'm assuming. So I've spent a lot of time thinking about this conundrum here. Like, how do you match the ball joint to a hip socket if you don't have a hip socket? Yeah. But... I'm thinking that the hip bone, like that pelvic region, was separated from the rest of the torso and sent to the morgue for this during autopsy. And they just didn't see the like upper half of the torso, the head or the arms. Yeah, I think there's a possibility they could do that with photos, too. If they have one end of of it and uh, a good high res photo of the pelvis, I think they could they could match that up. So it it sounds like the legs were primarily bone, huh? Just basically bone with a little bit of flesh still there. So uh, so that's why there was no DNA match. But it does. It totally sounds like the same legs for sure to me. Yeah. I mean, what are the chances yeah, of be cut a, marks being matched? A yeah. wild coincidence unless there was some high level conspiracy going on here. And that small, sharp blade, it reminds me of like a uh, box cutter or an exacto knife. Yeah. I didn't read any speculation about what kind of blade, like what they meant by small and sharp. Um, it could be anything from a buck knife to a razor blade, like you were saying. It's interesting to dig into that a little bit deeper because there's a certain type of person that would carry a buck knife and a certain type of person that would carry an X-Acto knife on hand. Has the uh, electric wire gone anywhere else? Did, were you able to ask Trooper Roberts about that? No, I haven't gotten him on the phone in the last month. I mean, he's good about getting back to me, but sometimes it takes a few weeks for him to you know, make the time and, and remember, which is fine. He's a busy man. 
And the electric wire that you're referencing is the wire that the cable that was wrapped around the suitcase and Buck Plank described it as something that you'd maybe string lights with. It's like a conduit type cable. Yeah, Romex wire. Romex. It's a rubber casing that contains three wires, positive, negative, and a ground copper wire. Yeah, it's interesting. I really feel like that's a pretty good clue. You know what you'd use to cut through that? An X-Acto knife. Ooh, Lance, you're smart. That's what you do if you want mm-hmm. to do expose the, the wires. What is an X-Acto knife exactly? It's like a box cutter. A box so, cutter. you know, okay. like a box cutter would be the, the retractable one. Yeah. So you could do that. That's in my head. And the X-Acto knife is like a pen with a little blade. Okay. But they have tools to that could cut could, the yeah. outer shell of the a yep. cable. You could snip that. And then, yeah. But, it, but they have a specific tool for it. I'm saying if you yep. work with it, you probably have that tool. Sure. They sure. have wire strippers. But usually if you're cutting like like the whole thing of a on a spool of Romex wire, you use, the, they're like pliers, but they're wire cutters yep. as well. I'm not saying that this is 100% accurate, but you match that cable with a type of person and the type of uh, profession that that person would have if they possess that cable, they probably have a precision, small, sharp object. Yeah, and potentially that that's the same object, same implement used to dismember the body as well. So say I, I have this body and I've taken it back to my home. It's in my garage. I have uh, tools at my disposal. If I have a knife in my hand, and I'm cutting open this body, would I then use that bloody, gross knife to wrap this body neatly? Like, wouldn't there be blood and DNA and, like, all that kind of stuff on the outside or the wrappings of the body? Yeah, also, if it's a work tool, then they're not using it afterwards. To dispose of that? Because I don't of know. blood, yeah. probably. I mean, uh, yeah, the smaller the blade, the bigger the mess, I would imagine. It's a pretty messy way to mess dispose anyway. of somebody, yeah. Yeah. But very neatly done. This is all very interesting. And you're right. I think I think talking this out is interesting because you can get some info into the psychology or the psyche of the killer. Kind of reminds me of Jack the Ripper in a way. Could it have been a scalpel? And could we be talking about a doctor? Doctor. Could be just as likely as a box cutter. But sure. I think the industrial wire combined with a small blade is, is more interesting, would move you away from doctor. Sure. So what kind of profession uses that? Electrician. Okay. <laughs> yeah, anybody involved in construction would have those tools in hand. Contractor scrapyard business but you talked about uh, the psychology of this person tim yeah. um i think the tools involved could definitely point to the profession that the killer might have had if we're if we're talking about a doctor or a highly educated person there's nothing logical about any of this disposal we've talked about it before the torso was wrapped so neatly like a present buck plank said and disposed of in a way that would be easily found in an area where people would hang out and then you've got the legs who are just tossed in a trash bag shallow grave dug and just like thrown out there it's very conducive to your theory earlier about it being more than one person it almost seems like one person said i'll take care of this and they take care of the torso and they wrap it up nice in the suitcase and then the other person that person's assigned the the legs just tosses them in a bag and then it's up to that person to dispose of them so that person just tosses the suitcase out of the car and it lands off the road in this creek and then makes a little bit of an effort with the legs. It doesn't suggest to me that the person who wrapped the suitcase is the one that tossed it. The disposal method is not didn't fit the same pattern. Doesn't fit the same pattern, yeah. Yeah, and I would add that if if this person or persons killed other people, I would say that you're not looking at the exact same way of disposal. You could be looking at suitcase or something, some kind of similar wrappings, but it would not be identical, I would think, because it there would have to be some de-evolution before. If this person got away with it, maybe they get more brazen. Or one thing that we're finding more and more that is kind of mind-blowing to me, men who have killed once, men with families who live states away and they've killed like one, one person or they're, they're linked to one and they're just otherwise like known as a family person. You could be looking at someone who did this once, freaked out, and hasn't done it since. It's a pretty interesting thought. But the the thing that is a sticking point for me is the different methods in which they were disposed of. If this was a a one-off and they panicked and killed somebody, the disposal in the suitcase and how neat it was, it wasn't even wet. It was so well concealed and well wrapped. I feel like that's somebody who put a lot of thought into that part of it, but didn't put a lot of thought into the actual tossing it out the window. Yeah, they did that real quick. Even the fact of the dismemberment is 
a little hard for me to believe that this is a one-off or the first time they've had a dead body on their hands. It's really difficult to put yourself in the position of somebody who like, accidentally kills somebody. I mean, my first thought would be get rid of the body, but um, my first action wouldn't be to cut the body apart. Yeah, no, there's if some you curiosity there. you experience with that, you're not used to seeing a dead body. That is a terribly gruesome act. Yeah, I would say that displays curiosity on the killer's part, curiosity of the human body. Sure. Or animal carcasses. You know, this could be a taxidermist. And I would say a lot more unlikely to be a, a doctor. That was kind of just showing at one end of the spectrum. I, I don't think any way this was a doctor, but it's not completely unlikely or completely impossible because, as we said, it does show some curiosity of the human body. I would say taxidermist and hunter. Medical examiner. It takes a certain person to want to do that kind of thing. Yeah. Someone who is more comfortable with the body, but doesn't sound like the people we talked about today. So if we go back to the auto the joint autopsy on the legs and the acetabulum, directly after their findings uh, were made and the reports written, they decided to incinerate the legs. I'm not sure why that call was made or who made it. It's just a fact. Washburn didn't didn't give you any information on who directed that? No, he wasn't even sure that they were incinerated. Oh, okay. He's like, I think they were destroyed. I'm not sure they were preserved. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I read in the in just the paper that they were destroyed. So it was a publicly known fact. Apparently, beyond suspicion, nobody questioned it. Yeah, I think if, if they're basically just bones and they took a sample, there's no reason to, to hold the space. We've heard as much being the case from some professionals. And uh, recently, Paul Holes of uh, the Murder Squad podcast discussed this very issue. And it actually kind of makes sense if they don't need the legs. But if they kept everything, it would be warehouses and warehouses full of full yeah. of evidence, and then you're just opening up that evidence to being damaged in numerous ways. Right. Or contaminated. How long after the analysis was done on the legs were they incinerated? Do you know? I don't know. I also don't know about the torso either. In my interview with Trooper Chad Roberts, he mentioned that the... Torso, head, arms, suitcase, all the physical evidence found with the torso were housed at the state police barracks. In subsequent talks with various law enforcement officials, um, even some lawyers or prosecutors, this doesn't seem to be a protocol. This does not seem to be a common practice that you would keep a body decomposing remains in a police barrack. Yeah, it doesn't sound right to me either. That would be in a morgue or something. Some kind of state lab. Uh, so they might have just gotten that wrong. Yeah. And unfortunately, when I had Roberts on the phone, I wasn't aware that this was a strange thing to do. So I didn't press him on it. So hopefully in subsequent conversations, he might be able to explain why it was housed at the barracks. But then he he launched into this kind of like gruesome story that, you know, all the, all the troopers sitting at their desks doing their work uh, started smelling this awful stench from suitcase Jane Doe's body and that her torso was sort of laying out to dry somewhere and her like the clothing and the quilt was like hung up on some sort of radiator and was left out to dry and the stench got so bad that they're like let's just get rid of it this is coming directly from Chad Roberts yes can you guys make heads or tails of that I like to recap everything you say yeah, please. for my own head. Everybody in the barracks was saying that the remains of Suitcase Jane Doe, including her torso and everything that she was wrapped in, was starting to stink. They were drying it over a radiator. They were drying the, the fabric over a radiator. I can't I make heads so. or tails of that. Why, um, yeah. why wouldn't that be in some sort of evidence? Locker well, room. I mean, they were probably trying to use it in their investigation and wanted to dissect the, that physical evidence a little bit harder, and uh, it took a little while, I guess. It sounds disgusting, would that not but... not be in a lab that they would be doing that? It depends, I, I would imagine, say. I couldn't imagine yes. them looking at the bed sheet and the quilt and, and saying it's a little bit damp. We'll just throw it on that radiator <laughs> over there. <laughs> I mean, these are you know police what? officers? I, 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 I can believe it. Yeah, I, mean, I can I absolutely guess, believe it. I guess because it happened, right? I can't I can't figure out the, the rationale there. I don't want to say that it speaks to something greater where they just didn't care because of the type of person this Jane Doe could have been. It's probably a resources issue. And, and a, a trooper from that era probably hears us and they're like, what lab would it be in? <laughs> That's probably what they're saying. Like, where? 
Tell sure. me where it was, where it should go, and I'll put it there. Yeah. You know, like, I'm sure they didn't want it there. Like, they were using it for work. Yeah, I mean, you can't fault them if they had no resources. Yeah. What makes that a little strange, though, is because they had so many different entities involved in this investigation. I mean, with the joint autopsy that was at Phoenixville Morgue, apparently they had room there to at least house the body for a month okay there you go and then they sent the dna out to cellmark diagnostic labs that was in maryland i believe so you have that entity in maryland like you have all of these different institutions involved wouldn't there be some place other than the radiator other than the radiator you would think so and this is correct me if i'm wrong this is the state police barracks correct yeah i could see it if it was like haverhill new hampshire and it's like four people but the state troops barracks, I mean, you'd think that there would be some sort of evidence room, but maybe there wasn't. But you you just cited like two or three examples of where other things were sent. At the end of the day, it was someone's call to keep it there for investigation purposes. I so guess, yeah. It just went on too long. It was just a task that didn't finish. Do you think that this is unfortunately a case where they saw the body and very soon after just said this probably isn't going to be solved? I Yeah, I think that's probably not an easy decision made by the state police, um, but they have to allocate their scarce resources to current cases that can be solved. I understand that, absolutely. But what I can't really get behind is them authorizing the destruction of the body. I'm not even sure if there's any physical evidence left. There's no more bed sheet or quilt or anything left over. No more suitcase. I don't think so. I don't have a hard yes on that. Okay. But I don't think so. Because as we learned at ASOC, we learned about the MVAC. It's like the the shop vac or the wet vac of DNA. And this is just a, a g- probably the gold standard for MVAC. You have so much stuff here that could have DNA on it. Right. So much like permeable material that just definitely has DNA on it. Could be vacuumed up in the way that the MVAC does it. Again, unfortunately, the the officers who were running the investigation at the time didn't know that that tool was ever going to exist. Of course. It's hard to fault them for it now. I think uh, things have changed so much in the way that law enforcement covers and, and tries to investigate these cases because of new technology and new sciences. But yeah, that that one was seems to be caught in a, a sort of like a valley of investigation. And uh, yeah, Lance, to answer your, your question, I kind of think a case like this, a Jane Doe, without apparently any killer DNA that we know of, I don't know how this case gets solved. In subsequent conversations with people that I know who are in law enforcement that are not connected to this case, they have stated that it is not protocol to destroy a body in an open homicide investigation. So like either either that's neglect or they're trying to cover up for something else. Well, hopefully Dr. Christ gets back to you and hopefully you can get some more answers about what does exist right now as far as the suitcase or the bed sheet or the quilt or the garment bag. Is there anything from Suitcase Jane Doe that exists right now that you're, you're confident of? The police still have in custody Suitcase Jane Doe's head. They have her skull. And I quote from Trooper Roberts, I held her head in my hands. So where do we go from here? So we have her skull. We have some dental impressions. We have a DNA profile on file that's uh, currently being looked at by Parabon to do some ancestry analysis and some isotope analysis to see uh, what region of the world she might have been from. So we have that to look forward to. We potentially still have physical evidence from the suitcase. I'm just not sure which items. Um, I'm just not privy to that information at the moment, but but hopefully some of that still exists that we could get a DNA profile from the from the murderer. On the other side of this, outside of uh, looking at a suspect, we have her identity, the mystery of suitcase Jane Doe's identity. So we have a couple couple avenues. We have our carnival lead, which I'm still looking into. The name S and S Amusements was given to me by the Diningtown municipality that they may have conducted a carnival around July fourth according to the time of death, might have been when she was killed. Previously, we had determined that s and Amusements was the was probably the name of the amusement company that hosted the uh, carnival. And mm-hmm. you've since found out that they had a carnival in the area around July 4th or on July 4th. Yeah, it's not, it's not a hard fact either, though, because this is just somebody's memory. I got the name of one carnival company that was here in Downingtown around July 4th. And then they were like, well... 
we weren't the one you were looking for. That was in a different location, and it was run by this company. So it's a matter of getting in contact with somebody from SNS Amusements and determining if they were here at that time. July 4th, 1995. July 4th, 1995. And then we mentioned on episode three that we currently have a a very viable suspect in this case. I can't talk too much about it, but I did uh, speak to the police and they and they said it was probably okay for me to release this one little detail about it. According to this alleged confession that we got, a suitcase Jane Doe was a hitchhiker. So what we can do is put out the word as best as possible to anyone who may have been in the area in Chester County, just outside of Philadelphia, who may have seen a hitchhiker who made it picked up a hitchhiker on the night of July 4th. So there's a suspect that's in custody for another crime? No, he is not in custody. Oh, it sorry. It was just a tip given to me by somebody connected. So there was a confession, though? Yes. Not from the killer? From the killer, a confession from the killer to uh, a friend who was in a relationship with the person who contacted me. So it's like double hearsay. The police were never involved in any of this uh, confession collecting. Um, It's not viable in court at all. It's just how this person got on my radar. Did you forward that to the police? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they told you that? That it was okay to say that she might have been a hitchhiker? Yeah. Yeah, they just said don't give any identifying details about the person who came forward to me or the suspect. And you have a name? I do have a name. I know what the person looks like. I know where they live, what they do with their lives. Does the suspect have any previous convictions or allegations or history of abuse or violence? Uh, yes, but I can't really say. Okay. Is it the same person that we were talking about in episode three? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. The reason why I wanted to mention the hitchhiker thing is because really all we're going on now is like information from the community. If you saw a hitchhiker, if you interacted with somebody at this carnival that matches the description of suitcase Jane Doe and you don't want to go to the police, email me suitcasejando at gmail.com. Or, you know, call the police. They'll handle the information. They're professionals. And a lot of times we hear that people would rather go to somebody like yourself as opposed to the police because they just don't want to get so directly involved, I guess. Yeah, that's understandable, for sure. I mean, if, if you're just a regular person who's interested in this case and you don't have any information directly connected to it, like, you can still help us. You can help us by posting our picture of suitcase Jane Doe, the recreation of her face and sort of bust area. Post that on your social media, post it on Twitter, on Facebook, get her her face out there. Uh, Post her vital statistics, how tall she was, how much she weighed, that she had pierced ears, she had brown hair. Maybe if you guys are into it, try to help me track down SNS amusements. We need your help. (laughs) 